thank you, Lord, for how merciful you are. When we look at the name that you gave to, to Moses in Exodus 34, you said that you are the Lord, compassionate and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, showing steadfast love to generations. Lord, we are among those whom you have shown your love. We thank you, Father, for the life that we have in you. We thank you that you are the lion and the lamb, the one who comes in power, yet is humble and meek and dies on the cross for us to give us life. Lord, we sing about how great you are, and there aren't enough words to express how great you are, how good you have been to us, Lord. Father, turn our hearts to you. Help us to love you in return. We ask that you would open our ears and open our heart and open our eyes to hear your word today. Lord, we ask that you would bless our guest speaker, that you would fill him with your power, and that as we um, study your word, Father, we would be enlightened to know you. God, help us to truly know you and help us to humble ourselves before you to understand you. Thank you, Father. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I hope that uh, this morning we will be encouraged by the word of God. And I would like to share with you from First Peter's epistle. We will uh, look from in fifth uh, chapter from verse verse 6 to 14. So I would like first of all to read the whole uh, passage. And then after that we will together dig into some truths that I believe can change our lives and can help us to live in peace in these uh, stressful days and years that we can all testify about. But we know as we have seen that if we surrender all to God, God will powerfully move on our behalf and he can do miracles and he can change a lot in our lives. So I will, I will first read from 1 Peter 5, 6 to 14. And this is what Peter writes. So humble yourself under the mighty power of God. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. In his kindness, God called you to share in his internal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you and he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. Amen. I have written and sent this short letter to you with the help of Silas, whom I command to you as a faithful brother. My purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you that what you are experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you, and stand firm in his grace. Your sister church here in Babylon or Rome sends your greetings and so does my son Mark. Greet each other with Christian love. Peace be with all of you who are in Christ. Amen. Amen. So uh, I would like first of all to start with First uh, Peter 5. 12, because we see in that verse actually that Apostle uh, Peter explains and uh, openly says why he is written what he just wrote to uh, 
believers. He said, my purpose in writing is to encourage you. So we need to have in mind this morning that if God's word will work in our hearts by his spirit, we will come out from this place encouraged. So this morning we all invested some time to come here, you know. No one popped up just in a second. We all had the time we needed to prepare, we needed to come here, and now we are sitting or standing here, and all the time that we have invested actually this morning goes in that direction. God wants to encourage us this morning. This is the purpose why Peter wrote this part of this epistle, to encourage us. And I want to remind us all that actually what is different from courage or uh, encouragement is discouragement. So today, while you are listening the word of God, I hope that by His Spirit, God will change our attitudes in our hearts. So if we are discouraged this morning, and there are a lot of news that are going around us that wants to discourage us. And so many times we worry, we have cares that we carry with us that can squeeze all life out of us. But God's word, word this morning has one goal and one purpose, which is to encourage us. And in other way, it is actually stepping back into courage. That's encouragement. We come back in courage. And in days that we live in, we need to be courageous people, brothers and sisters. We live in times when we cannot hide or uh, run away from the challenges that we face. We need to face challenges in our everyday life. And to do that, we need to be courageous. Christian life is life of people who are courageous to speak and do things that other people are afraid to do. This is part of our calling. And this is what I believe this morning we will together see by the thoughts that Apostle Peter shared with us. So let's start with verse 6. Once when we uh, concluded that this passage will encourage us. Let's see how God will do that. And verse 6 says, So humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Or this translation says, Mighty power of God. And at the right time, He will lift you up in honor. So, I want to tell you that basically... What uh, Peter says is, we need to humble ourselves under mighty hand of God. This verse says, power of God. And we know that it, when Jesus Christ in Gospels speaks about Holy Spirit, he actually speaks about finger or hand of God or power of God. So we as a believers have spirit of God inside of us. This is God's power. This is I believe how God enables us to live the Word of God. Because in our strength, with our wisdom, with our uh, abilities, we are always coming short for what God has placed before us. So this is why uh, Apostle Peter says, stay in grace of God. Because it is by grace of God. And what we can see is that there are two invisible hands that work in our lives. There is invisible hand of our environment that tries to shape and mold us in the way that we will be like people that don't know God. So this invisible hand, hand will try to influence our behavior and our thinking. But there is another invisible hand which is a hand of God that works inside of us and it shapes us and molds us so that we can be his representatives and ambassadors in the world that is falling apart. And, you know, everyone is shaped. The only question is which hand is shaping us? 
And I believe that we need to be careful about the environment that we live in because so many times we can be shaped even not noticing it that we think like people around us that don't know God Almighty. So we st try, uh, to, we worry, we are under pressure and we behave like we don't have hope and we don't have God in our lives. So, if we want for God's hand to work in our lives, first thing that we need to do is we need to humble ourselves. And then if we humble ourselves, God will start to work. First of all, I just mentioned a few minutes ago that we are called to be courageous. Which means that so many times, at least I, I hope some of you, because uh, I hope I will speak to some of your uh, hearts and minds, but so many times in Christian churches we have idea that being humble means that you are insecure. Being humble means that you are inferior. You feel like you're like, you know, uh, fearful, scareful, and you're like, hello, aha, uh -huh, this is how I am humble. No, it's not a picture of being humble. I believe that actually being humble means that we recognize God's hand in our lives as authority. And our response is that we serve God. Not we, that we complain serving God, but we serve God in gladness. This is how actually God's hand or God's spirit uh, will start to work in our lives. When we humble ourselves and when we realize that only when we are under his authority, his power, power can start to work in us. How we will do that? By humbling ourselves. And I can give you these two pictures, which is one thing is if we recognize God, in humble way, we will recognize ourselves as his servants that are serving him with gladness. So uh, this is number one. Number two, we will also recognize and understand that by God's grace, we received every good gift in our lives. Which brings us again back to attitude of gratitude. We need to recognize what the Hebrew word says uh, in Old Testament. It's the same word for womb and grace. Do you know why? Because everything that you will produce good in this life will come as part of his grace. So we are channels of his grace so that he can be glorified and only things that will bring fruits are things that are initiated from him. And this is, I believe, very important that we understand. Being humble doesn't mean that we are inferior or insecure or like, hello, you know, we have all these ideas and images what being humble means. Being humble means what just ex I explained. And <coughs> I will conclude these thoughts with what is written in Hebrew 12, 28. It is written, since we are receiving the kingdom that cannot be shaken, one translation says, let us have grace. And another translation says, let us be thankful. And I was curious, why is this verse so differently translated? But when you start to dig, you realize that there is a same root word for two Greek words, which is evharisto, meaning thank you, and haris, meaning grace. So in one way, one translator had in mind, if we want to stay in the kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, which is how you do it, by being thankful. And another translator had in mind the end goal, which is let us have grace. Let's stay, let us stay in grace. So it's the same thing. And if we want to experience really God's grace in our lives, we need to humble ourselves. 
And one of the ways to humble ourselves is that we are thankful towards God. Amen. And what is the other picture if we don't do this? You know, in the oldest book in the, the Bible, the book of Job, there is description of Leviathan. And many theologians believe it's uh, Satan. But one of the things that is written in book of Job about him, it is written and said, he's a king of all that are prideful in spirit. So, he's a king to all who are prideful in their spirit. And what is the function of the king? To rule. You know, the prince of this world and this age will rule only in those who are prideful. Pride is something, and we will see later, is a totally opposite of being humble. So we know that even if we are prideful about our religion and our about our prayer lives and our about our Bible studies, we are still prideful. And pride is something that need, needs to go out from our lives if we want God's power to work in our hearts and through us. So, uh, if we obey what I just said, if we humble ourselves, look what Peter reveals to us. He says, and, the and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. What a great thought. Not only that God is asking us to humble ourselves, but he also gives us here promise. He says, if you humble yourself at the right time, I will lift you up in honor. And let's see first these words at the right time. I always think about what prophet Isaiah wrote in chapter 60, verse 22. When the time is right, I, the Lord, will make it happen. And many times I need to hear that, and I hope some of you need to hear that. If we humble ourselves at the right time, not our time, we have totally different timing, Sometimes we want to hurry up. Sometimes we push in our own strength things to happen. And we are frustrated and we are stre in stress because things don't happen as we planned them. But this morning I want to encourage you. If we humble ourselves at the right time, when the time is right, I, the Lord, will make it happen. What he will do? He will lift us up in honor. This is great promise. Not that people will lift us up. Not that good connections will lift us up. God himself will lift us up in honor. This is his promise and his word. And this is great truth, but this is just one part of the picture. Jesus Christ actually in Gospels gave us the whole picture when he said that if you humble yourself, God will lift you up. But if you exalt yourself, God will humble you. And this is the spiritual law that works all the time. If we humble ourselves, God will do great things. He will exalt us. But if we do God's job before we actually do what we needed to do, if we exalt ourselves, we will be humbled. And if we really study our lives so far, I believe that every one of us can recognize this spiritual law working in our lives. You know, things are difficult, we have difficulties, and we are on our knees. We finally cry out to God, God help us, please. I humble myself. God starts to work. God gives, lift us up. Things start to happen great. We see the honor, everything is going well, but guess what? The first sin in history that is described to us didn't happen on earth. The first 
sin happened in heaven. And the first sin that happened ever is the sin of pride. And this is why it is important that we this morning understand that the way up is actually down. The more we want to go up and be lifted and exalted by God, the more we need to go down. And I believe that so many of us this morning need really to stop and think, am I humble? Do I really serve God with gladness, without complaining and murmuring? This is just one of the tests that we can take. Test number two, am I complaining? Am I murmuring all the time? Am I speaking about faults and problems in other people's life? Am I in that atmosphere? Or am I living really in grace of God, God in this uh, Kairos, uh, sorry, uh, Haris, because I have F. Haris to I am thankful to God. I am glad this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Do I wake up in the morning and say, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, that you have made this day and I will rejoice. I will be glad in it. This is the attitude, actually, that God is asking for us to have. It's our choice to take it and obey it and rejoice with God. And, of course, through the problems that we go, to go in His strength because His joy is our strength. This is what I believe this morning we need to ask ourselves. Because I believe that God's will for all of us here is that he wants to exalt us. He wants to lift us up in honor. But we need to cooperate. We need to have partnership with him, which is we need to do our part. We need to humble ourselves. Okay? I hope that some of us can hear this word and do something. And you know what? Although we are thankful to French printer who divided first time in history Bible in chapters and verses there are still sometimes problems because we miss a thought that comes before the verse that we have to preach and I just want to come back for a second to the verse before what I had this morning which is verse 5 second part that says God opposes the proud but gives favor to the humble. Other translation says, gives grace to the humble. So there is a position if, if we are prideful. But if we humble ourselves, God will be with us and he will give us grace. I just wanted to really uh, stay a little bit in, in this thought because it's life-changing moment when we humble ourselves. That's the beginning. And now, if you say, okay, that's great, that's fine. But how I can humble myself? And I believe the key thought, the crucial thought in this passage, most important, is found in 1 Peter 5, 7. 1 Peter 5, 7 is the truth that can change our lives forever. When I came first time in evangelical church, it was 3rd April in 1994. I really enjoyed preaching, and I wanted to buy a book from the pastor who was preaching that morning. And then I came to him and I said, can you please sign your book? I would like to have signature of the writer. So pastor wrote a few words of encouragement and he signed. But since I was new in a church, I asked, hey, hey, wait a minute. What is this one Peter 5, 7? And he said, ah, oh, he will explain to you. And then I first time in my life heard, look, New Testament is divided in uh, chapters and verses, which means you need to go to first Peter. I said, OK. And now you see these are chapters and then you have verses. And then I, for the first time, I digged 
in Bible, and I dig this spiritual truth that I want to share with you this morning, which is this cast or this uh, translation says give give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you I believe this is the key thought that apostle Peter is giving as encouragement this morning to us this is spiritual diamond that we need to take. And you know what? Up to this moment in your life, so many years we were programmed to worry. We were programmed to have cares. And even if for the moment we experience, experience peace of God or rest, we think, oh, if I'm not nervous, if I'm not worrying, I'm not responsible person. We believe in lie that being respons responsible means that you need to have worries and cares all the time in your life. No. Our responsibility is to live in peace of God. This is our responsibility. And you know, my great grandfather was the first diamond grinder in Balkans. He lived in Belgrade. His name was Stojan Oreščani. So he has even done some uh, rings for Tito at the time. But I want to tell you this morning, I believe this is the diamond that I want to give you from the word of God this morning. This is the key thought why Apostle Paul, uh, Peter wrote this. 1 Peter 5, 7, that verse that I first time digged into the Bible when I found it, when I was introduced to the Bible, to the New Testament. Give all your worries and cares to God. Oof. So easy to say, but so difficult sometimes to do. Do you know why? Because it distinguish our prideful intellect that is sometimes watered with education and with a lot of knowledge and with a lot of thoughts that sometimes sound so wise but actually behind that is fear so many times in christian circles we hear people speaking from wisdom that actually is nothing more than fear itself and if we speak about responsibility in our lives we need to speak about responsibility staying in God's presence, which is staying in the peace of God. This is our responsibility. You know, many mothers, many uh, wives, uh, they are great Christians, they are great persons, but they think, if I don't worry, hmm, I am not responsible. I need to worry. I need to care because something is wrong if I don't care and worry. You know, it's like the same with medicine. When I was a kid, every medicine sound was tasted so bitter and so bad. And later on in life, they, when they have some medicine that they give you and it's like bomb, you think, oh, mm, this is great medicine. But is it working? Because medicine needs to be ugly and it needs to be bitter and bad. Is the same thing when we think about this verse. This is the key where our pride will stop and we will humble ourselves. If we say, okay, Lord, I finished universities. I have intellect. I, have, I love to read books. I have so many opinions about so many topics. But when it comes to the point of trusting you or doubting you, that's the key. And this is the thought. Give how many worries and cares to God? All. All. Many times we think, yes, but does God care for this area of my life? This is such a thing that how God will bother himself with that. If this bothers you, 
it bothers God himself as well. Do you know why? Because we see in this seventh verse, it says, give all your worries and cares to God because he cares for you. He cares for you. And actually, if we realize that he cares for me, I know that the enemy that we will spoke in a few minutes about, he will come and say and whisper or speak loud into your life and says, yes, but if God cares for you, how all of these things happen into my life? If God cares why this happened and why that happened, and we will come now to that second thought. Look again, what is the purpose? Why? Why Peter wrote this epistle? My purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you that what you are experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in His grace. So first part, we already concluded that why he wrote this epistle is to encourage us. But he says also, I wrote it because I want to assure you that what you are going through is a part of God's grace in your life. I thought when I, when I was a young Christian, if I am spiritual enough, I will have no problems. Just positive, God is good, no problems, no challenges. But I realized actually later on, the more actually you live with God, you become problem for someone. And the more you live for God, expect that there will be some attacks and that there will be some people who will recognize you as a target and they will do everything to destroy your life because they don't know whom they serve. But you know, once when we say, okay, Lord, I give all my worries and cares to you. And this is the humbling situation, believe me. We today overthink, we overthink and we are sometimes over responsible for people who don't care a second to change. We want to be their rescuers, but there is only one saver. And so many pastors burned out in their ministry because they wanted to be savers. They wanted to be over responsible and they overthink because they wanted to control things. And I want to tell you this morning, in the moment when you, when you give your own cares to God and worries, there is a moment when you lose control about what's going on in your life. And this is humbling experience that I, you and I need to have if we really want to experience God's grace. This is the key, I believe, brothers and sisters. Be because I can tell you there are nights when I am fighting with my worries and cares, when I am literally having that picture like Jacob who was wrestling with God. There are cares that can suck and they can squeeze life out of you. That can make you five years older for just one night. Because we hold our worries and our cares. Because we think we will solve them with our clever minds. That's wrong. That's pride. We need to humble ourselves. And you know, there is in 2 Corinthians uh, one warning that uh, Apostle Paul says to us. We need to stay pure and simple in Christ Jesus. Simplicity doesn't mean stupidity. But simplicity means if God said that, I will believe that. My life experience I don't understand yet well and fully. My emotions go up and down. My circumstances are totally different from what God promised. But I stand on the word of God because I know that Jesus Christ himself said that heaven and earth will pass away. But my word will never pass away. Circumstances can change like this. 
Emotions go up and down like this. But word of God stays forever. So we can stand on that word of God. And this is why Peter says, stand firm in faith. Be strong in faith. This is the key. Because we have enemy. And we have a picture here of the enemy explained from the wild world life. Because it says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. I will stop here. Lion. He is roaring like a lion. Why is lion roaring in the jungle? One of the thing is, when he roars, I believe he wants to scare the prey that he is after. Fear is the first and primary spirit that devil or Satan is using to control our lives. I will say it again. Fear is the spirit that our enemy is using the most. It's the first weapon he will use against us in our lives it's spirit of fear and he roars like a lion but we know there is only one real lion in spiritual world and in world the whole world which is lion from the tribe of judah he is not roaring like a lion he is the lion when he roars, everything needs to bow down. And we have that lion inside of us. We have a song. He is lamb and lion. Sometimes we need to be like lambs. Humble means sometimes that. But sometimes being humble means courageous to stand and roar as ambassadors of God against spirit of fear that wants to limit us in our beliefs. And once when we start to fear people and men more than God, we start to conform. And we become the same as they are. Because we think that if we say something against, people will think, ah, he's stupid, he's not deep enough, he's close-minded. And all of these things that they are putting into Christians nowadays. But I want to encourage you. Lion roars to create fear, but God did not give us spirit of fear. He gave us a spirit of power and love and sound mind. And I can tell you that dog, when dog feels that someone is afraid, it is reaction in him that actually he is more aggressive towards people that fear. Did you recognize that? You have normal dog and everyone is playing with him and then comes someone who fears. And that dog feels that fear and it actually inside of him creates that aggressiveness. Why, do, uh, why, do, why are you afraid? Mm -hmm. It's the same with the lion who is going around looking who, whom he can destroy. Because enemy always comes in our lives to do three things and none of those three things are good. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he is going around looking how he can do that. He is roaring. But if you are in faith, if you stand firm in faith, as Peter says, you are hidden from him. He cannot see you. He cannot recognize you. He don't know your next move. Someone hurt you, and he says, I got him now. And you start to bless and forgive those people. He cannot see you. You're hidden for him. In Colossians 3, 1 to 3, you can see that we are hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. We are hidden, and he cannot see us, you know. Because every morning, every animal that knows that it can be prey to lion. Some of those animals are wise. They go to water. 
Do you know why animals go to water early in the morning? They need to baptize, so to say, their skin. So when the lion gets early in the morning for the breakfast, and when he starts to go around and to smell, he cannot recognize those who were baptized in that water, river or lake, because the smell from the, anim uh, from the animal is not so strong. And lion goes around. But you know, you have animals that are already filled with that water. I want to tell you this morning, if we want to be unvisible, really hidden in God, with Christ, when enemy comes, he cannot smell our carnal nature. He cannot smell our ego and our selfishness. But he goes around and he cannot find you. Because you're an enigma, you're a mystery for him. Whatever you do, whatever he does against you, you do actually something differently that he didn't expect it. That's the, the essence of spiritual battle is doing different things than your enemy is, is expecting you to do. So this roaring lion, like a roaring lion, is going around and he's not joking. We see here that Peter says that he is, we have a great enemy. You know, many people say, hey, this is my great friend, but we have a great enemy. And he's not joking. Many Christians say, ah, it will be okay. Don't worry. No, if we don't change, if we don't repent, if we don't seek God and walk in his presence, it will not be okay. <laughs> you know, today's... We have today spirituality, like idea of spirituality that goes in church like this. If you're spiritual, you will be positive. Did you hear that? So being spiritual is being positive. Come on, be positive. God. Yes, being spiritual means that you are growing in love. You're growing in hope. You're growing in faith. Yes, in, in, in his spirit. But being spiritual, what Peter says here, is being alert and aware of your great enemy. Spiritual people who are sensitive, they are sensitive also for the strategies and tactics that the enemy wants to use against them. And I need to stop here and to say, to give a balance, there are two extremes in church. Either you have people that see the devil and Satan in everything. Oh, this is enemy. And we have even joke, you know, when uh, in marriage, uh, husband and wife, they had a fight, and then wife or husband, wife takes something in kitchen and kicks uh, husband in head, and she says, oh, sorry, the Satan did, made me did it. <laughs> so there is one extreme that we actually uh, blame uh, him for everything. But there are people from another side that don't want to recognize his existence and that he's active. They say, oh, he is in hell. I wish he was in hell, but he is not in hell. He is defeated from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. He is defeated. But to really walk in that victory that we have, we need to obey God. And in Romans 16, it is written, Apostle Paul uh, finishes his letter and says, let the God of peace crush Satan under your feet. Right? So here, Peter says how we can walk in peace of God. Because peace of God is a weapon that will crush Satan under our feet. We will walk in victory. And this roaring lion will uh, run away from us if we Take the diamond that we received this morning for, from great grandson of a guy who had that job. I'm giving you this morning spiritual diamond and please take it because the first thing that the enemy will do in our lives, he will try to steal that spiritual diamond. But do you know how? He will not steal it directly, this truth, but he will give small care, Small worry, bigger worry, bigger care. And in one moment you realize, oh, 
the thief was there. The diamond is stolen from me. Don't let him do that. God cares for us because he loves us. And this is what I really want to emphasize this morning. Uh, I will now say a few more words and then we will close in prayer. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. Amen. So, what we see here is actually that, number one, God wants to encourage us. Number two, God wants to say to us, seeing that you are suffering and that you are part of a battle, is not that you are not spiritual. It means that you are very spiritually sensitive and that you recognize what's going on. But look, first thing, he says he wants to encourage us and second thing, he says he wants to assure us that what we are, are, are experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. What is truly part of God's grace for us? I will tell you that the same material is in coal and in diamond. The diamond is actually coal that was under such a huge pressure that it became diamond. Material, it's the same like you are using people who have houses and they have coal that they're, you know, you can have kilos in it for making fire. But the same material, small, small like this, can be valuable sometimes thousands and thousands of dollars or euros, 10,000, 100,000. So diamonds are valuable because they were under pressure they were, so to say, in our context, under suffering. And I want to let you know that I believe that suffering is a part of God's plan, not to destroy us, but to make us that we shine as a gold or diamond more and more after every suffering that we go through. Now, I believe that we need to help uh, each other in church by being more honest with responsible and people that we trust what we are going through because there are so many people in church that are suffering deeply but they don't have a person where they can open up or in the past they open up to the wrong people who said oh really this is so bad to hear, hear what you are going through and then they abuse this trust and they go around and slander and speak about the truths and secrets that you really wanted to share with someone and they go around and s spread the news what is going on in your life that's terrible but it's part of experience if you're part of religious places like church am i alone or do you agree with me in this so you come to someone to really pure, pour your heart, to be honest, and someone takes that and abuse that. But we need to be more honest because, you know, Jesus came not to call those who are well and healed, but he called those who are sick to heal them. And I believe that in every church where I go and look what's going on, I see that if people care more about what's going outside, you know, you have religious spirit that is actually doing the work where people are trying to wash their uh, life like a glass from outside, not from inside. 
and why we need to know that other people are going through the same suffering that we are going through because there are people that already overcame what you are going through this morning there are people that can give you advice but not from prideful position how this happened to you i i can i cannot understand are you christian well, you know you have more guilt and condemnation with when you are with superstars in Christianity that are actually prideful and many times hiding the things that you are going through. I said God is opposed to prideful people even if they are prideful about their religion. And I really believe that we need to have in church people that we can trust and that we can share our suffering that we are going through. Look, life is divided in three stages. Either you're prepared, God is preparing you for some battles and some sufferings. You are maybe in the midst of some sufferings and battles. Or you just came out. And this is the three phases, I believe. And you know what Peter says, after a while... If you suffer, God will encourage you and support you, and he will strengthen you. That's the process. You know, when you come out from suffering, <laughs> you know, I, I remember once, I, one brother in church was really, really depressed and uh, in bad shape, and I asked him, hey, how are you doing? He says, because it was a thing that people who wanted to have great faith, uh, repeated like uh, parrots and he was fully in depression and he said hallelujah never better i <laughs> said you really look and sound like it was never better in your life but so many times we put those religious smiles and we, you know we we are like how are you oh great and everything is pr marketing and everything is branding mm -hmm. you know but the Apostle Paul says, you know, if I will brag about something, I will brag about my weaknesses. Can someone come here this morning and brag about some weaknesses? You know what I mean. We lose many things, prestige. We lose uh, many, maybe some connections. We lose some uh, benefits of the society or close people. Of course, we need to be wise. As I said, we should not open our mouth and heart and share with everyone the worst things in our life but we need to have someone if we want to survive that's why i believe peter says hey your brothers and sisters are going through this what they're going they're going through suffering but once when we go through suffering after a while god will restore us he will support us and he will strengthen us do you know what's the biggest problem in our lives, I believe? Uh, is that, and I will, I am landing. Uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> the biggest problem in our life is that we are creating suffering after suffering. You know, there is a suffering, let's say, is a part of God's plan. I mean, there is a fight. And now, then after that, we suffer because of our suffering. Actually, we have, I call it self-pity party. <laughs> you know, suffering is over. God wants to encourage you, to strengthen you, and to, that you go farther to new level, to new battles, to new things that God has for you. But after suffering, we create suffering. Why this happened? And then self-pity party starts. And we never allow the Holy Spirit who is encourager and he, who wants to encourage us say hey, so many things you don't understand in the past. So many things in life you will not understand. But you can understand this morning that God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. And if he gave his son for you, will he not give everything else to all of us? So I'm calling all of us this morning to really stand up 
and give our worries and cares to God. Because in that way, we will humble ourselves from our intellectual puffed minds that know the best everything. And we will humble ourselves in simplicity, not stupidity, but simplicity, recognizing that God loves us and that we, He will take care of our lives. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and let's pray. Or is someone else doing a prayer? Thank you, Lord, for this morning. And thank you, Lord, that you want to encourage us all. We open our hearts and we speak together with the psalmist from Psalm 118, 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. And Lord, open our spiritual eyes that we can see today that the Almighty God, you, Almighty God, you are our Father, that loves us and cares for us. We give you now all our worries and cares and thank you for your peace and grace that enable us to overcome everything that comes on our paths. Thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.